We'll be hitting kind of some of the skin reactions due to food. That's going to be the big thing we hit off the bat. Well, I have a, a four month year old son who actually had some skin reactions recently. And we noticed some nuts and, and seeds and eggs were actually a, a big deal as well. So some women who are breastfeeding and if their kids have skin issues, the first thing you want to look at is your diet. The natural tendency is to go to the pediatrician and typically it's going to be some type of corticosteroid cream a lot of time that's going to be recommended, but a lot of times changing the diet helps. Uh, in this particular situation, his skin was also more reactive because it was just super, super dry based on the time of the year. So we just used some pure lanolin and that helped as well, but also making some diet changes also really, really move the needle. So one of the first things we can do is make diet changes uh, on top of that. And sometimes people who are already coming into this health space on a paleo template, they've already cut out grains and, and maybe the junk food and the refined sugars and the not so good fats. But then they're like, wait, I'm still having an issue. And it could be eggs, or it could be nuts, it could be seeds, it could be those, you know, will be the bigger foods that could also be a problem, maybe even nightshades. And I'd say autoimmune template may be the next thing we want to jump on versus just a strict paleo template. Yeah. And it's hard for kids too, right? I mean, my little girl is, what is she, eight months old now? And your little boy's what, coming up on four months? Um, yes, my second son, Hudson, he's almost four. And then my son, Aiden, my first son, Aiden's two and a quarter or so. Yeah. So see, the, the, the interesting thing is a lot of things that we see in kids, like our own kids, are the things we see in the people that we're working with clinically, because I'm not saying that the infant gut is the same as an adult gut, but in the sense that the adult that comes to us that has all these problems they have a leaky gut and they probably have low diversity just like a baby does. You know, a baby basically comes into the world with a leaky gut and low diversity that you have to build up and create. You kind of have to manufacture a good microbiome in an infant. So a lot of things that we see in our own kids, it's interesting because we see the same thing in adults. So you mentioned your son having issues with eggs. Same thing with our little one. We gave her some eggs and then boom, immediately a rash on the cheek. And we gave her some almond butter and then boom, immediately a rash on the cheek. So I want to point out one thing, which is that these foods that are put into the paleo or like the ancestral category, they're really not that paleo. They're really not that paleo. Meaning, if you take like an almond butter bar, for example, how many almonds would that have taken to create that bar? And how hard would it have been for our ancestors to take the almond off the tree? I think the almond is sealed up in something, isn't it? Where you have to probably crack it open and get the almond out versus right. when you eat a bar. It's just so hyper processed. It's like, yeah, it's organic. It's this and that, but it's like that never would have happened in nature. So I think a lot of our food reactions may happen just because we're being exposed to things that we shouldn't be exposed to like an almond bar. That's like 200, you know, 200 almonds, for example. Exactly. Now in regards to that, I mean, it, it can be more of an issue when there's already a potential nut sensitivity to begin with. And then you're eating the equivalent of like multiple handfuls of nuts. That could definitely be a problem. But in general, if you're pretty good health, that could be a good option for like an 80-20 thing where like there may be like a healthier cheat, paleo cheat wise that is in your ballpark. And, and that's kind of where you want to try. I think it's great for that. But we just want to make sure we don't make those things staples. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I love a good organic almond bar here and there. But uh, just when it comes to food reactions, I'm trying to find a picture of it. This is the sad thing. I've never actually been to an almond tree to see how the almond sits on the tree. I'm sure it's encapsulated in some sort of shell. Yeah, I see a picture here. So yeah, so it is encapsulated of some sort. So I mean, you think about an ancestor, they would have been having to crack that bad boy open. I mean, you probably would have been tired after 15, 20 almonds worth of cracking, you know, you're not going to eat just handfuls and handfuls and handfuls or scoops and scoops and scoops of butter. Yeah, 100%. I, I agree. So we have those are other types of food reactions. So now when the kids are younger, it's different because mom has the full ability to control what's going in to her and to her breast milk, right? So we have that. Um, the next thing is as kids are starting to eat their own foods, now what? So the first thing I always look at is trying to use safe starch alternatives over any kind of grain. I think that's always safer. So I'll always go to a yucca flour or a cassava flour or some kind of an arrow root, which is usually a combination of primarily yucca as a good, healthy, safe starch, if we're going to consume something processed, right? So I always try to keep that in mind. Number one, we don't get a lot of those in our society, right? And number two, we don't have the gluten sensitivity component because there are other types of grains, corn, rice, and oat 
that you know are in that gluten free category. They don't have gliadin in it, but they have horizonin or avenin or or a zine in the form of corn. And these are cousins and sisters and brothers of gluten. And there could be this case of mistaken identity, just like there's a family resemblance in certain families. Well, there's a, a, a immune resemblance to the immune system in regards to gluten. So we got to keep that in the back of our head. Yeah. So if you just look up gluten cross reactivity, there's actually some testing out there, some highly advanced, expensive testing that you could do if you wanted to try to get an answer on paper. But a lot of times you can just figure it out based on how you feel. If you get a rash, for example, like I was doing organic blue corn chips for a while. I loved them. This was probably a couple of years ago. And then I started to have reaction. It would either be like a headache or just some change with the skin. And so you're basically saying that with the receptor, corn can sort of fit into this gluten receptor, meaning that the body gets tricked. It's sort of like, oh, this is gluten. And then boom, it's going to go create this inflammatory response. But it was an accident. It wasn't actually gluten. It was corn. And this is the same thing with chocolate, believe it or not, and coffee as well. Uh, what else is on that list? Potato is on the list, yeast. You mentioned rice. I mean, gluten cross reactivity is a huge, huge link to skin problems. So this is like the low hanging fruit to look at. Yeah, there's definitely that. So we have to keep that kind of in our mind. That's like the first thing, because there are a lot of people that come onto this camp and they just, you know, gluten-free is a very trendy thing. We always draw a line between gluten-free processed and grain-free uh, alternatives. That's, that's really, really important to kind of highlight, number one. Uh, number two, poor digestion of even foods that we're consuming that we're, aller that we're having allergenicity to and immune response to is a big deal as well. So the more we can break that allergen down, makes it easier for our gut to process it. And why so, is that process failing though? See, that's the thing that people don't, they don't get. It's like, okay, I'm eating, I'm eating good. Why am I still having these issues? Well, because if, if a food is naturally inflammatory for you or creates a stress response in your body, that stress response is going to make it harder for you to make enough enzymes or acid to be able to process the food to begin with. So we have to just know that that may be an issue and combat it with more enzymes. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, you know, there, there are certain foods that are like, we call it like an intolerance. Like an intolerance is a lactose intolerance where maybe you can't break down that sugar in milk, i.e. lactose. But if we give you more enzymes, the lactase enzyme, you can handle it. So it may not necessarily be an allergen issue. It may be an intolerance issue. And it may be a combination of the two because the more intolerant you are to something, the, the larger that molecule is in your gut and the greater chance that that thing will then now there'll be an immune reaction to it because we weren't able to break it down into like a peptide type of form, a really small form, if you will. Yeah. And what you're saying without directly saying it is there's like a spectrum of reactions. So it could be just a very, very minor quote food intolerance or food sensitivity. And then you go all the way up to like straight allergic reaction where after you eat the eggs, you've got the gallbladder pain, you've got the sniffles, you've got the headache, you know? So in, in between that spectrum, of course, there's other root causes beneath. So it's not just the eggs that you blame. Then you have to investigate the gut and figure out, well, is the gut compromised with some sort of infection? You mentioned the enzymes. Well, why? Why is there not enough enzymes in the first place? Is this just age? Is it not chewing the food enough? Is it that they were stressed while they were eating? They're like scrolling on Instagram while they're trying to eat their meal. What or the, the, heck food, is going the on? food in itself is stressful. So yeah, so the, the easiest first thing to do is just get more enzymes and acids in and make sure you're chewing your food up well and you control the stress in the environment. Those are the first two to three things. And then from there, if we still have problems, then we can of course start cutting or paring back foods or just trying to cook the foods better. People forget that the reason why we cook foods and part of the reason that our brains evolved is through fire. We were able to cook, you know, imagine eating like raw flesh very hard to digest that and process that. As soon as you start cooking it with fire, you're able to start pre-digesting a lot of that food. And that food then makes it more accessible to your gut and to your brain and to all of your organ systems. So just by cooking that food up better, using an Instapot or steaming those vegetables or um, you know, sauteing it, you, you access more nutrition. Like if you look at like, I think it's, if you go to like My Food Data or you go to the U.S., Department of Health, where they look at nutrition, like like nutrients in food. And if you just compare the nutrients in raw broccoli to cooked broccoli, the, nutri the, nu the nutrients actually go higher in cooked broccoli. Why? It's because we can actually access those nutrients. We can access them. That's the difference.